There's a story of a man who wanted to do something special for his wife, so he knew she liked fur coats, so he went out and bought her this beautiful black and white fur coat. And he gave it to his wife for Valentine's Day, and she went, ooh, ah, this is an amazing coat. What kind of animal is this? And he said, it's a skunk. <laughs> and she's going, ooh, and ah, and then she stops. She says, I can't imagine such a beautiful coat coming from such a foul, nasty beast. And the husband goes, hey, all you had to do was say thank you. You didn't have to <laughs> insult me like that. Uh, sorry, I, I had to do it. <laughs> this morning we're in uh, Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 13. And we're looking at uh, prayer as the primary work of God's people. And uh, we're, we're working through the Alliance core values. And uh, last week was lost people matter to God. And uh, this week we're talking about Prayer is the primary work of God's people. And uh, that is based on a couple of things. Uh, for instance, nothing of value lasts unless it is bathed in prayer. Nobody raises higher than their prayer life. So what your prayer life is, is your spiritual, that's going to be as far as you're going to rise spiritually. Prayer is the foundation of every ministry. And prayer is the expression of our theology. Uh, there's a saying, pray first. And to that I've added, if you don't pray first, you're going to find that prayer is the last refuge of the desperate. And how many people will do their own thing and then when they run out of their own resources, run out of their own steam, have nowhere else to go, do they decide, I'm going to pray. And God's like, ugh. Should have started there. <laughs> yeah, saved yourself a lot of energy and a lot of trouble. So let's look at this. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside says, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if, you, uh, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, he will give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So let us pray. Again, Holy Father, we seek you. We ask that you would give us the ears to hear, the heart to accept and understand, but even more so that you would warm our hearts in such a way that as your children, we cry out to you, Abba, Father, Daddy. And what a special privilege that is to, to go to the God of the universe, not only the, do, you, do you know our names, but you know us personally from the inside out, from the beginning to the end. And you have invited us here this morning to hear what your Holy Spirit is saying to us. So 
Again, uh, give us wisdom and understanding into this passage of Scripture, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice that the disciples came to Jesus, and they didn't say, Jesus, teach us how to be happy. They didn't go to Jesus and say, Jesus, teach us how to do miracles. They didn't go to Jesus and say, Jesus, teach us how to be as good as you are. Instead, they went to Jesus and they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. Now, one of the thoughts is that John the Baptist had taught his disciples how to pray. As did many of the religious leaders of the day, they would teach their students a specific prayer, which kind of marked them. So if you heard someone praying, you could say, oh, that's one of John's people. That's one of uh, Phineas's people. That's one of, you know, Elias's people. You know, you know what I'm saying? So maybe they were looking for a specific prayer that would mark them as followers of Jesus. However, my suspicion is that they had watched Jesus pray. And this is about the fourth time already in the book of Luke that they had seen Jesus pray. And, and my suspicion is what they had seen is Jesus praying and things happening. Dare I use the colloquial word? Jesus prayed and stuff happened. And isn't that awesome to, 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 to know that when Jesus prayed, so, so this must have made such an impression on the disciples. But they went, to, they went to Jesus and said, Jesus, we want to be able to pray like you pray. We want to have that kind of power that, that when you pray, you know, demons scream and run away. We want to have the kind of power that when you speak, people listen to you. We want to have that kind of power that when you pray, sicknesses go away. We want to have the kind of power that transports us into the very presence of God the Father Almighty. So when we look at this, uh, I want to start with three levels of prayer. Now, these levels depend on absolute uh, dependence on God. You think about this, if you're not dependent on God, if you're not thinking, you know, God is awesome and God is almighty and God cares about you, hmm, what good is it? So the first thing we have here is a, is a level of worship. And Jesus taught his disciples, our Father who art in heaven. We start with the word Father. Uh, father is a, is a very uh, close term, right? But it's a very formal term. And uh, others, the other places in Scripture, we see we're told to approach God as Abba, Father. And Abba is the more colloquial term that would mean Dad. And some people say, hey, that goes back to the idea of child's first words. Child's first words is always, Dad, Dad. Uh, I know, you, sometimes you think it's mama, but it's really dada. <laughs> At least that's what I heard. <laughs> but there's a relationship that's here. And if you think about it, can you not go to your, your for those of you who remember having your father with you, uh, still alive, uh, mine has passed, but can you remember going to your dad and saying, dad, what do you think about this? You weren't sure, so he would give you insight. Uh, after all, they're old and wise, right? I'm not sure I like old and wise going together. But experience does give you a certain wisdom. <clears throat> you could go to Dad and say, hey, I need some help, and Dad might show you how to do something you didn't know how to do. Remember learning how to drive? It was Dad who took you out to drive, right? Right? The reality of it is we have this relationship. But we have to be careful. Because <clears throat> even though Dad, God the Father, is our Heavenly Father, our Dad, our Abba, we have to be careful that we don't reduce this relationship to a peer relationship. He is not one of us. <laughs> he is holy. He is separate. He is special. He is awesome. He is not corrupted by the garbage nonsense of this world, which is why he can love us, which is why he can uh, come alongside of us and pick us up when we've fallen down. It's why he can come along and, and do the things that he does because he's not corrupted by any of this. God our Father is not our buddy. 
And he's not our buddy because he can be so much more than our buddy. I noticed they were interviewing a certain prince this week. And he had gone home to visit his father, the king, when his father had been diagnosed with a certain illness. And I'm sitting here and I'm watching this, and he said that he was just grateful to be able to go home and see his father. And I'm thinking, wow, that's amazing. Here is the son of a king who can just walk into the palace and see his dad anytime he wants. Just like us. Anytime we want, we cry out our Father who art in heaven. And so it's, uh, really if you think about it, prayer is not a uh, luxury. It's a necessity. There's a story that comes out of uh, Africa. In Africa, the tall grass and whatnot, the, 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 the believers would carve out a, an area that they would pray individually. So each person had a path, and that path led to a special place where they would pray. And what would happen is if they stopped praying, their path would grow grass on it. So they'd come alongside each other and say, Brother, the grass grows on your path. Uh, would it be interesting to have something that obvious in our lives? <laughs> that we could uh, encourage one another, that we could look at our path and say, you know, the grass is getting high on my path. I need to get back to this. But our Heavenly Father wants us to come into His presence. In fact, we're told to boldly go into the presence of God. You think about it, when Jesus was crucified, in Matthew, the, the, the story in Matthew, when Jesus was crucified, one of the things that happened is that God tore that thick veil that, uh, in the temple from top to bottom. And uh, what an amazing thing this is that God is saying, there is now no separation between you and me. Woo! I mean, hey, like, again, if that doesn't get you all excited, then your wood is wet. Being able to call someone father also means there's an intimacy that goes with that. My suspicion is that you know things about your dad that no one else knows. And I'm, suspect, I'm suspecting that your dad knows something about you that no one else knows. There's a certain intimacy that goes with that. And when we go to our Heavenly Father, we know that he knows everything about us. And what, 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 tell you what rattles my cage, he knows everything about me, yet he still loves me. Warts and all. I don't have any warts, but. He loves me. He looks at me in all of my flaws. You know diamonds are flawed. That's how they tell a real diamond from a fake diamond. I mean, a manufactured diamond. A manufactured diamond is absolutely perfect. It's made in a lab and it's crushed. You know, everything is perfect. But a real diamond has flaws in it. Doesn't matter how beautiful the diamond is. Doesn't matter what the rate of the diamond is. The jeweler can look in there and go, oh, I see the little crack here. But when we look at a diamond, we don't, look at it as a jeweler does and look at all the cracks. We look at the diamond and we see the cut, we see the sparkle and we go, ooh, wow. And God looks at us and even though he knows us intimately, he still loves us. And then the prayer goes on to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm quoting, I think, from Matthew, but that's the general idea there. Um, there are kingdom rules. And one of the things about kingdoms is there's obedience without hesitation or dissent. We have a king of kings and lord of lords. And someday, every nation is going to come under his authority. Actually, I think if you think about it, every nation is already under his authority. They just don't realize it yet. And some are in rebellion to God. And someday that's going to come to an end. 
And as Philippians chapter 2 tells us, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. I don't know about you, but every two years I do not want to watch television. In fact, I think I might actually take a sabbatical this year of watching television. Why? Because there are going to be commercials. I don't mind commercials for cars. I don't mind commercials for eating establishments. But I get tired of political commercials. Amen. They're designed to do one thing, and that's get you to hate someone else. To be angry about something. And I'm like, that can't be healthy for a society to continue to go through that. In some day, all of this nonsense is going to be a distant memory, if we even remember it at all. And the world can be at peace. We're not going to be yelling about one side or the other side, and we're not going to be taking sides on things because there's going to be the king of glory, absolute ruler, and it says that he will bring healing between nations. He will judge between nations, and he's going to bring healing. In all of the garbage and nonsense that we're going through now, gone. Why? Because we're praying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the reality of it is, uh, someone has said that prayer is not about getting man's will done in heaven. But what prayer does is it gets God's will done on earth. And my experience with prayer is when I pray, it's not so much going to God and say, gimme, gimme, gimme. It's God coming to me and saying, here's the change that I want in your life. And the closer I get to God, I think I'm growing closer to God. <laughs> and as I pray, I feel more and more God speaking to me, God changing me. And I'm like, oh, okay. So it's not a laundry list of give me this stuff. It's a relationship of grow growing closer and closer to my heavenly Father. And what an awesome thing that is to be able to do. Uh, the, 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 the second level of, of prayer here is, is the physical. And uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, it says that God humbled his people by letting them go hungry and then feeding them with manna so that they would learn. Now, here's the thing. If God let you go hungry, would you consider that a blessing? Most of us have not missed a meal in a long time. <laughs> we have the tendency to, to look at things in this world. And if they feel good to us, we go, yes, they're good. If they feel bad to us, boo, that's bad. I actually know a man, and I, I can talk about him because he's long since dead. But God actually cursed him by making him a multimillionaire. And what happened is, when he found out he had all this money, he became the most miserable person that I have ever met, and still have ever met. And you think, wow, wouldn't most of us rejoice if God landed $42.5 million in your lap? Most of you, yes, I'm going to Hawaii. Instead, he crawled into a shell. He became angry and he became bitter. And I felt so heartbroken for him. And so, you know, sometimes things that we think are good in this world, actually, maybe not so much. Sometimes we think the, the things that are, go on in our lives, that, you know, like sickness or something like that, are bad. But instead, they turn out something for God's glory and honor. And when you look at this, uh, our daily bread, uh, the, the whole idea, oh, by the way, the, the bread, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, after God lets them go hungry and then feeds them with manna, the, the lesson here is man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. 
So what happened? Jesus was in the wilderness. Forty days, no food. I don't know. I, yeah. I think around week three, somewhere in there, you actually lose your desire to eat. But still, after 40 days without food, the devil comes to him and says, turn these stones into bread. Nothing wrong with that, right? Uh, it is if the devil is telling you to do it. Amen. And Jesus quotes this, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And I like that word daily. Give us this day our daily bread. We live in the United States of America. Compared to the rest of the world, population-wise, there are very few of us that go hungry on a daily basis. Now, there are people that do go hungry. If you work in the schools, you probably see more children than, than should that are hungry because they just... For whatever reason, they're not being fed. They don't have the resources. The parents aren't there. Whatever it is. So, but for the most part, we can go home and we can open a refrigerator. And you probably have more than just water cooling in your refrigerator. Most of you can open the cupboards and there might be a can or two of soup or whatever it is in whatever. So many of us have the resources. but not everyone does. There are places in the world where they might have food today, but they don't know where their food is coming from tomorrow. Don't you love it how God cares for those who are most needy? And in this, I think he's trying to teach us that everything that we receive, we receive today our blessing from his hand. Even though you have plenty of food in your refrigerator and in your cupboards, guess what? God has still provided that for you. Okay? Again, I'm talking about the majority of people around, but I know that there are those who don't have that. And I know that there are people who are struggling. But the reality of it is that God is there for us daily. And our needs are not just physical. Our, our needs are spiritual. Our needs are emotional. And, and there he is every day providing for us. He's taking care of us every day. The third level of prayer, I'm going to keep moving here, is spiritual. Verse 4, forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. There's a reason that we ask God for forgiveness, but there's a kind of a flip side of this. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgiven people forgive others. Got it? So if you are forgiven, you will forgive others. Pretty simple. Jesus told the story of a man who owed the, the, the king or the, his, his creditor 10,000 bags of gold. I'm just going to use that for an example. And the man went and said, I can't pay it. And the, the, the king said, I'm going to sell you and your family and everything you have to pay your debt. I can't pay it. Okay, I'll have mercy on you. So the man went out and grabbed another man who owed him 100 bucks, grabbed him by the throat, started strangling, and said, pay me or else. I'm sorry, I can't pay you. So he has the man thrown into debtor's prison. I can never figure out debtor's prison because how do you throw a man into a prison and then expect him to pay you? <laughs> and the rest of the servants saw the man do this and they went back to the king and said, hey, that guy that you just forgave 10,000 bags of gold, he couldn't forgive a guy a $100 bill. And you think of what everything that God has forgiven you compares to what someone has done against you? E, minutia. What someone can do to you compared to your sin and your ledger that God has forgiven you. What an awesome thing that is. So forgiven people forgive. And uh, we have to be careful. Hebrews chapter um, uh, 
12, verse 15, we talk about the spiritual side. Um, Be careful that no one fails to receive God's grace and begins to cause trouble among you. And I like how the New Century Version puts this. A person like that can ruin many of you. And this is talking about bitterness. Bitterness causes trouble. Bitterness causes us to get a hold of something and not let go of it. And we're supposed to be forgiven people who forgive others. But when we don't forgive, what happens is anger sets in. And anger leads to the dark side. I mean, anger leads to bitterness, which is really the dark side of humanity. And you see what bitterness does when generation after generation after generation after generation hate one another. And these shooting feuds start between families and, and they, they, they start between clans and they start between villages and they start between people groups. And pretty soon you have all these ethnic groups hating one another almost to the point of violence and some to the point of war. That's what bitterness does. And God comes along and says, hey, if you've forgiven, if you've been forgiven, you will forgive. And bitterness is not going to take root in our lives. So he's also talking about protection here. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Or in Matthew, deliver us from evil or some of the newer translations say deliver us from the evil one. It could go, in the Greek you could translate it both ways. Deliver us from temptation and evil. And what happens again like, like, do you guys have dandelions around here? So you go, to, uh. you love dandelions, right? I I understand that dandelions came here because the, the the pilgrims that originally came across wanted their greens for the salad, and I guess they had dandelions for salads. Uh, now they're weeds that everybody tries to get rid of. Have you ever tried to pull a dandelion up by the roots? You get maybe about this much of it. But you know the rest of the roots are another three feet in the ground. <laughs> and, and, and that's what bitterness does. That's what unforgiveness does. That's what uh, happens when we do not forgive. It opens ourselves up to all the sins and all the evil and all the temptations. It weakens us. So there's three levels of prayer. There's three levels of contrast, and we're talking about the knowledge of God here. The first one is uh, the friend in need, and I, this, is a, this is a fun story. Then Jesus said to him, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. So this is Hospitality. This is Eastern hospitality. A friend comes to you and you give him bread. You take care of him. But suppose you don't have anything. What do you do? You go down to Craig and Mary's house and you knock on their door. Bang, 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 bang. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. So we're talking about a clash of two Eastern customs. One is you always, hospitality. The other one is you don't bother someone at midnight. (laughs) Their houses technically usually were were one-room houses where the children and the adults slept in the same room. How many of you remember trying to get a child down to bed? That was always a fun time, wasn't it? That was a parent's favorite time of the day. I'm not going to bed. I'm not tired. But you had to get him to bed. So the kids are asleep. You're in bed. Boom, 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 boom. What do you want? I need bread. Shh, 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 shh. My kids are asleep. I need bread. And... Jesus goes on to say, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of a friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, 
he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Quiet down, I'll give you. And he's shoveling the, the, the bread out the door because he doesn't want his friend to wake his kids. Does it feel sometimes like we have to pound on the door for God to answer? This is the first contrast that, that, that Jesus is making here is between you know, a friend that's reluctant because of the time of night and the circumstances and God the Father Almighty. This boldness, this shamelessness actually approaches on not uh, fitting in with social conventions. It's a desperate and it's intense. If a bold attitude works on a reluctant friend, what will it do with God? Uh, the second level of contrast, I'm actually going to pull from Luke chapter 18 <laughs> because it sort of fits here. Uh, a widow seeking justice goes to the corrupt judge. Give me justice. Corrupt judge says, who are you? You're just an old lady without a husband and no family? Forget you. So what, is the, what does the widow do? Goes back to the judge. What does the judge do? Get away from me. So what does she do? She comes back to the judge. What does the judge do? Get away from me. And about the 3,485th time that happens, the judge goes, Ah, oh, I don't fear God, but this woman's going to wear me out if I don't give her justice. And there's that persistent widow going to the judge who doesn't fear God, he's corrupt, and she gets justice. So how much more will God listen to his children who come to him? Now the third case here is, I'm going to call it the bizarre case of the evil father. Uh, verse 11, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. And you go, what kind of dad would do that? Well, I hate to say it, but I think our society has slid into some of these awful things. You then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So if we, in contrast to God, are evil and God is holy, and we know how to give good stuff to our kids, how much more is the Father going to do for us? By the way, there's a tagline in that verse. I'm going to get to it after, later. <laughs> so, um, How much more? See, God's character is goodness. God's character is eagerness to answer prayer. So there are also three levels of praying. So there's three levels of prayer, three levels of contrast between God and uh, humans. And there's three levels of praying. Look at verses 9 uh, through 10. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. So the first thing is ask. If we ask, we receive. So here I am, and I'm going to say, Hey, Mary, could you pass me that book? There's distance there. And all I've done is use my voice. And so there's, uh, when we ask, we get something we, we don't possess. I want the book, so I ask Mary, and she passes me the book. And probably throws it, hits me square in the eye, between the eyes. I just. <laughs> so there's ask. Ask and receive. The, the, the second level of prayer is seeking. And as we seek, we find. We look for something. Have you ever lost your keys? And what happens when you lose your keys? You go, eh, they're gone. I'll just get a new set. 
No. What do you do? You look for them. Uh, you don't tell your husband or your wife or your friend or <laughs> someone else to look for them? You don't call the police and say, hey, I've lost my keys. Come look for them? No, you look for them. Eventually, you get to wit's end and you do start asking people around you to help. <laughs> but you look for them. And when you look, it's act actively searching for something. There's movement, there's effort. And I think sometimes prayer requires us to actively seek something. For instance, if you're praying that God will allow you to lead someone to the Lord, that's not going to happen if you're sitting in your easy chair at home. I mean, God may bring someone to the door. That's happened before. But usually that means that you get out of the easy chair and you walk out the front door or the back door and you go and you talk to someone. So you're seeking. The third level of praying is knocking. Isn't that annoying? You're sitting there enjoying your lunch. You're sitting there enjoying whatever's going on in life. Boom, 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 boom. <sighs> Interruption. Some people are like that. Others would be like, oh, goody, who's at the door? So you run to the door and you open it. And this idea of knocking removes obstacles. And the obstacle here that Jesus is talking about is a closed door. And to knock, it presumes an answer to prayer. So sometimes you got to go and you got to knock. You assume that God is going to answer your prayer. And there are some great testimonies of people in churches that have acted on something in faith, not knowing where the safety net was, and God provided it. Just like when he asked us, give us this day our daily bread. There's a story, I think it was George Mueller, and uh, he had an orphanage, and the uh, kids sat down for breakfast, and they came to George Mueller and says, we have nothing George Mueller gets up and he prays, thank you for the food that we're about to eat. And the rest of the staff's looking at him like, you're crazy. Answered the back door. Who is it? Well, it's uh, the bakery guy and his truck just broke down. <laughs> and he wondered if you have any use for all this bread that's in his truck. So they collect that, and no sooner had they started distributing bread. Guess what broke down in the backyard, or in the back alley? A milk truck. So they had bread and milk for breakfast, which apparently was gr a good meal for an orphanage back in those days. So knock. Ask, seek, and knock. Now, I just want to throw out a couple of cautions here. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 2. You want things, but you do not have them, so you're ready to kill and are jealous of other people. You still cannot get what you want. So you argue and fight. You do not get what you want because you do not ask God. If you haven't noticed, I'm a guy. <laughs> Males like to be asked. True, guys? Back me up on this. We like to be asked. If something needs to be done, we, we, we're not, uh, what's that, telepathic? We can't read people's minds. <laughs> Please tell us what you want to done. We like that. And I'm not saying God is like that, but the fact is, he wants us to ask. And I think he's like, you know, dad inviting us into his presence saying, hey, ask me what you need. Ask me what you need. He wants to hear that. And one of the things that it does for us is when we ask him and he provides, guess where we uh, understand who's providing? Okay? It's pretty simple. We ask God the Father and God the Father provides and we can't say, hey, uh, look at me, I did this. And God says, who did this? That's why he wants us to ask. Uh, in Psalm 106, 
there is a uh, a long story of the children wandering around in the in the wilderness, children of Israel in the desert, those forty years. And there is a there's a verse that scares me spitless in Psalm 106, and it's verse 15. You gave them what they wanted, but he also sent. Or sorry, he so he gave them what they wanted, but he also sent a terrible disease among them. Once they wanted meat. Give us meat, give us meat, give us meat now. So God caused all the quail to fly in and land and they, they, they had a feast. And it says, while the, 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 the food was still in their mouth, God struck them with a the disease. Yikes. Please understand this. Not everything you want is healthy for you. If an eight-year-old decided what they were going to eat for breakfast, it would be ice cream and cake. If they decided what they wanted for lunch, all they would eat would be candy. And for supper, it would be all of that plus everything else that was sugar. Sugar. 